All right, and let's start. So welcome everyone to the Biome webinar series. Um, I'm going to put this link in the chat. And so if you aren't already on our mailing list, if you don't get emails from us, and I'm not sure how you heard about us maybe, but if you want to get on our mailing list, our outreach uh, email list, then fill out that form. It's really simple. I think it's just like name, grade, school, and then your email. So fill it out to get more you know, info from us. So let's just jump right into it. Today, we're going to be talking about this thing called yeast to hybrid, WTF. And as we all know, that acronym stands for what transcription factor? So today, we're going to be talking about a technique that some synthetic biologists use in the lab. And so we're going to explore what this yeast to hybrid thing is. And as you'll guess, it will have something to do with transcription factors. So yes, thank you, Sarah, for the YouTube channel link. That's also there as well. So our past webinars are also um, in our channel. So again, I put the form link in there. Definitely fill that out if you want to hear more from us in the future and if you're interested in this kind of stuff in Symbio. OK, so as always, I'd like to start with sort of the big picture. So I, I made this picture here where it's like a doggo, and he's bringing these two you know, dog toys together. And he's like, now kiss. So this is the idea of yeast to hybrid. So yeast to hybrid is a technique where we're trying to see uh, we're, we're examining two proteins, for example, and we want to see if those proteins interact, if they kiss, right? if they have those bonds and they can interact preferentially inside the cell. And of course, this kind of thinking has a whole lot of consequences, a, a lot of like real world, you know, really important consequences. Because if you think about things like signal transduction pathways, right, or enzymes, or really anything involved with proteins, proteins have to interact with things in the cell, right? Proteins aren't isolated systems. You, you have these multi-protein complexes, these huge, huge molecular machines inside your cells. And they do that by interacting with each other. So protein-protein interactions is the goal that we want to study using this technique of yeast to hybrid. We call it PPI, protein-protein interaction. Um, it's kind of confusing because PPI also means pyrophosphate, if you know some uh, biochemistry. But in this webinar, PPI means uh, protein protein interaction. It's proteins kissing, right? Like these dogs. Okay. So before we get into it, if any of you are in maybe in, in high school biology, you'll hear this over and over and over again. So it might just be worth it to just, you know, memorize it now because this is called the central dogma of biology. Guys, it's so important they call it central. <laughs> the central dogma of biology says the information flow inside cells goes from DNA to RNA. Right? You transcribe transcription DNA into RNA. It's kind of like the scribes in ancient times, and they write down, they copy things, right? But in this case, the scribe is kind of lazy, and then he made a few mistakes, so the T is turned to use, basically. Now, RNA gets translated into the language of proteins, right? So translation, we're changing languages. We're going from the language of these nucleotides into the language of amino acids. For example, HVM. So different chains of amino acids can then make up this protein, this molecule. So today, yeast to hybrid, we're going to focus on transcription um, because that's really where this technique targets. Now you might be like, wait a minute. I thought we were talking about protein-protein interactions. Why, what, why is this star here? Why is it not here, right? Um, I'll, I'll get back to that. <laughs> so for now, are there any questions? So please, please, guys, ask questions during this webinar. Um, you know, that's the real advantage of you guys being here in person. Oh, not, not in person, online. Um, but please ask questions if you, if you have any. Either text it in the chat or unmute yourself and speak out loud. Either, are, either is fine. All right, if we have no questions, we can move on. So next, let's talk about genetics. I feel like when you're talking about biology, the first thing that pops into people's minds is DNA, right? I feel like DNA has become the iconic sort of molecule of DNA, that double helix, right? It's very beautiful. However, we can kind of simplify the DNA molecule as a line because biologists, you know, when they draw diagrams, they're lazy. This line is DNA. And we can start to sort of dissect the different parts of DNA. So that kind of makes sense of what the different sequences are saying. So we have a start codon and a stop codon. Those just mean, hey, this is where we start and this is where we stop translating that protein, right? 
the start codon tells us, okay, our protein is going to start here, and we're going to translate that language of nucleotides to amino acids from here all the way to the stop. We call that the coding sequence. There's also a promoter region. So those of you who were um, maybe in the webinars before or have taken maybe a genetics course or a bio course before, you might have heard of the promoter. So promoters are things that promote something. Well, what do they promote? They promote transcription. Remember, transcription is the idea of going from DNA to RNA, right? You have a scribe going from DNA to RNA. So the promoter actually recruits something called RNA polymerase. Now, I know there's a lot, there's a lot of words going on here. But RNA polymerase, you can think of it as the scribe, right? The scribe is writing down from DNA to RNA. He's just copying down the letters. RNA polymerase is doing that. So RNA polymerase is scanning along this, this sequence of DNA, and it's turning all of the, the DNA nucleotides into RNA nucleotides. And that's how you make things, for example, like mRNA. And that mRNA can then go to make proteins. So that's how sort of genetics works at a a very sort of overview level. And you also have a transcription stop site, but we're gonna focus on here, the promoter and the transcription start site. Now, transcription, as we said, was going from DNA to RNA, right? But now this RNA polymerase is actually really, really interesting. So here it's shown as a blob, right? But I just like to use blobology. It's kind of like, we just show everything as blobs because it's easy to draw, right? It's easy to show in a diagram. However, let's take a closer look at this blob, right? If you start studying these, these genetic systems, you know, how does transcription actually start? It's actually pretty complicated. You've got all these proteins. So all these circles, all these blobs are proteins, right? So it's not just RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is this blob here, right? But it's not just that blob. It's a whole bunch of blobs coming together. And it positions the RNA polymerase just right, just on that promoter, so it can start transcribing. You have, you know, all these protein, you have a DNA bending protein, you have these things called transcription factors and mediator, all of these different things coming together to get transcription to work, right? It's a really complicated system. Are there any questions on this so far? Because this is, this is a key background for the yeast to hybrid assay that we're going to be talking about. Any questions, please text them, text them in the chat or unmute yourself whenever you want. Please interrupt me. All right, no questions. So, now let's take a look at transcription factors. So, oh, this might take a while to start. Oh, it's, I think it started now. So the question is, why do we need transcription factors? I'm trying this out. So everyone who is listening right now, please go to this URL, pollev.com slash alantong820. And then this question should pop up. So I want you guys to go to that website and just maybe write a few words, You know, maybe write a phrase, why do we need transcription factors? Remember, transcription factors are factors, are proteins that help with transcription. Why do we need transcription factors? I'll wait a few moments for responses to roll in. And let me know if it's not working. If it's not working, we can just do it in the chat as well. Why do we need transcription factors? Transcription factors help us transcribe, helps us turn DNA into RNA. What's their purpose? Why do we need them, right? Why can't we just have every gene turn on whenever we want, right? Why don't we just have every gene always on? Ooh, got the first problem. They help guide RNA polymerase to the right location on the DNA. That is true. Yes, exactly. So transcription factors, they can bind to certain regions of DNA, right? Like how does RNA polymerase know where to bind? Exactly. Transcription factors, they help guide it to the DNA. They ensure we only transcribe when needed. That's also a really good point to make sure that they are expressed in the right cell at the right time in the right amount throughout the life of the cell and the organism. Good response. Because they prevent mutations that could be harmful. I'm not sure about that. I haven't heard of anything about mutations with transcription factors, but maybe, maybe. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Regulate production of proteins when needed. Okay, we have regulation aspects, right? Control. You don't want to directly transcribe DNA. Exactly. So it has something to do with control as well, right? You want to control when to transcribe DNA. I think you guys get the point, right? We need transcription factors. Oh, one more. They control and regulate the expression of genes. Exactly. So we have this idea of control, of regulation, right? Biology is all about homeostasis. We want to control and regulate different processes inside the cell. So 
I can use the analogy of a supermarket, right? If you were in a supermarket and you were working as a manager, why the hell would you want to sell Christmas trees in July, right? It makes no sense, right? Why would you do that? It makes no sense. So these, these transcription factors are kind of like the workers who are like, hey, don't sell Christmas trees in July, sell them in December, right? When Christmas comes around. Transcription factors, they tell the DNA when and where to transcribe the RNA. So we had this idea of regulation, and that's very key. Oh, gosh, what does that mean? Whoa, I can make them big and small. I didn't know that. Okay, anyways, <laughs> let's move on. Okay, so you guys talked about what transcription factors are, why they're important. Um, I'm just going to go off this, this tangent really quickly, and this doesn't really have anything to do with these two hybrid, but I think it's a field of study that some of you might be interested in and some of you might be interested in learning about later as well. So we talked about genetics. Right? Genetics is the idea of studying the information in DNA, right? how that's transcribed into RNA and protein. There's also this field called epigenetics. Right? So epigenetics, epi means on top of. right? So epigenetics is the study of the language on top of genetics. Right? Genetics itself is a language. You have the language of nucleotides, A's, C's, T's, and G's. Right? That's genetics. What is epigenetics? It's the language on top of the language. It's kind of like if I were to write a paragraph, right? The letters that I use to make up words and the words make up sentences and the sentences make up paragraphs, right? That's your language, that's your genetics. Epigenetics is the underline, right? The bold, the italicized, the highlighted regions of that paragraph. So epigenetics is kind of like a language on top of the language, right? We have this idea of, well, if it's highlighted, I know to focus there. Right? If it's bold, I know to look there. Whereas if it's striked out, right, I know not to look there. So it's a language on top of a language. So epigenetics works by relying on modifications. You can modify things called histones. You can modify the DNA itself. And that can control if it's on or off. So think of it this way, right? You have, the pro, you have the DNA here. It's very spacious, right? The DNA is like, all right, I've got this mansion, so much space, I can spread out, spread my wings. Here we have DNA that's very closely packed, right? Very uncomfortable. It's kind of like in a subway or like a really crowded place. So this is off. Which one do you think transcription factors have an easier time binding to? The left one or the right one? Uh, you can text in the chat, I think. Which ones can transcription factors bind to, left or right? Okay, so people are saying left one, right? It's obvious, right? It's obviously left because there's so much more space for those proteins, transcription factors, to slip in there and bind to the DNA to help it transcribe. And that's why this is the DNA that's on. It's being actively expressed. Whereas this one's off, right? If it's closely packed, it's off. So that's another tangent of transcription factors. Let's go back to the main story, the main uh, event, right? The stage. This is an even closer look at this RNA polymerase. So I won't even pretend to understand what's going on here because most of these things, I have no idea what it is, but I just want to show you guys the complexity, right? People spend their entire lives studying these systems and you know, mad props to them. So check it out. We have pole two, um, that's RNA polymerase two. So it's one of the three types of RNA in eukaryotic cells. And you can see the DNA is wound up inside of this massive protein complex. It's not just RNA polymerase. It's also got these TFs, transcription factors, other transcription factors, more transcription factors. You know, all of these factors, all these proteins are interacting, right? PPIs, protein-protein interactions. They're interacting to facilitate, to help this RNA polymerase too, to transcribe the mRNA to finally make protein. And an even closer look, right? I mean, even this, this is still blobology, right? To get a really good appreciation of what's really going on here, these are protein crystal structures. Oh my God, it's so good, guys. These are protein crystal structures um, of this RNA polymerase complex, this massive, massive um, macromolecular machine. So Samantha asks, if you could give this diagram a title, what would it be? Ooh, this one mean, uh, this one here, or the one on the next slide? This one, okay. What title would I give it? I would probably give it something like RNA polymerase two in complex with 
it's transcription factors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, transcription initiation complex, that's good too. So transcription can be thought of as having different stages. Right? You have initiation, elongation, and termination. This one seems to be in its initiation phase because there is no mRNA coming out yet. So yeah, I, you can call it the transcription initiation complex. Very good point. Thank you, Arthur and Samantha. So here is the, the crystal structure in all of its glory. Right? You can see there's, there's, guys, these are all amino acids linked together. Right? These are proteins that fold up in very specific shapes so that they can do their job. Right? Structure begets function. Uh, here's a yeast versus a human um, initiation complex, I believe. And you can see that they're, they're pretty similar, right? We're both eukaryotic cells. And I guess that kind of shows a certain evolutionary pathway that this has taken. So this is sort of just to give you guys an appreciation of the power of structural biology, especially, because I feel like more and more increasingly, we're getting more and more of these structures, of these protein complex structures. And we can learn a lot about that through these structures. So. Let's go back to the main point, right? We talk, we're talking about yeast 2 hybrid. We wanna get back to proteins. Now I've been throwing the word amino acid around, but I can't guarantee, you know, I wanna make sure that everyone knows what this is. Because amino acids, you can think of them as molecules and they're molecular Legos. And you can string these Legos together to make a protein, right? A singular Lego isn't that interesting. But if you build like a house of Legos or an airplane out of Legos, it suddenly becomes very cool right? Same thing with a protein. You can construct it. You can construct a protein out of amino acids, and those amino acids can start to fold up. The protein can fold up. This chain of amino acids can adopt a certain three-dimensional shape, and that shape is ultimately what dictates its function. So proteins are strings of amino acids that fold up in a certain way. Now, it's kind of like this, <laughs> where the protein, it starts off right after it's translated, right? It starts off as this chain. It's just a linear chain. But then as it's subjected to the environment in the cell, you've got water molecules making bonds, right? You have certain hydrophobic residues that don't want to be in with the water. You have hydrophilic residues that want to be with water. You have all these different things, these interactions going on that help the protein fold into a certain shape. And this is a energy diagram and you can essentially assign an energy to each confirmation. And then the protein is going to adopt the confirmation with the lowest energy. It's, it's going to be most stable at that state. That's why there's like a, a trough at this place. So it's kind of like <laughs> people wobbling and dancing around. Right? It's kind of like just shake it all around and see what form you get. Because you can see the protein shaking around. There's probably some thermal energy going on there. But at the end, it's going to adopt some very beautiful, wait for it, wait for it, some very nice and structured 3D shape like that. So it's that final, we call it native, that native 3D shape. That's what we're trying to get at when we're talking about PPI, protein-protein interaction. We're thinking about, for example, protein one and protein two, they're adopting these three-dimensional shapes, they're stable native conformations. How do those two shapes interact, right? And do they interact? So. Yeast 2 hybrid, this technique, I know I haven't really talked about it at all yet, but yeast 2 hybrid relies on the fact that proteins might interact. We want to see if they interact or not, right? Are they going to kiss or are they not going to kiss? So there's all kinds of interactions that can draw these two proteins together. For example, hydrogen bonds, right? Ionic bonds, plus and minuses attract. You can even have hydrophobic interactions where because things don't like water, they want to stick to each other more than they like water. That's more stable if they're sticking together. You have van der Waals interactions, more ionic bonds. So you have all these kinds of chemical, atomic level interactions. And each of these interactions, you can think of summing them all up. And if the sum of them is favorable, then those two proteins are going to interact. They're going to kiss. They're going to stick together. right? But at the same time, you don't want them to be forever stuck together. Because certain times, you want the protein to be able to dissociate. right? So there's a balance between sort of association and dissociation, depending on those protein-protein interactions, depending on those hydrogen, ionic, and van der Waals bonds. So that's the idea of protein-protein interaction. I feel like the most iconic example of this is the antibody and antigen uh, interaction. So if you were there for, for last time's webinar, uh, the great and majestic Colin Kaliki <laughs> gave us a webinar about ELISA. So the idea of ELISA is you take 
antibodies and you bind them to antigens. And the fact is, antibodies, they're very specific for a certain antigen, right? The structure of the antibody is posed. They have these hypervariable regions. The structure is posed so that it will bind to a certain shape. And that shape is called an epitope, for example, of an antigen. And I feel like this is very relevant, right? We're all home. We're all quarantined. Why are we quarantined right now? I want to go outside, right? I want to meet friends. Why are we quarantined? Because of COVID-19, right? COVID-19 is a threat to us because we don't have these antibodies against the COVID-19, right? That's the idea of vaccines, right? Vaccines, if we, if we develop a vaccine for COVID-19, it will, oh, that rhymes, <laughs> vaccine for COVID-19. If we develop that vaccine, then our body can start producing these antibodies against the COVID-19 virus. And that's when we can start going outside you know, and enjoying time with friends. So it's very relevant to your guys' life today. Any questions so far about these last few slides? I need a moment to pause and ask questions or else I feel like I'm going too fast. <laughs> All right, let's move on then. So this is an example where it's very important um, to talk about protein-protein interact. Oh gosh, <laughs> I'm moving on too fast, okay. So here's an example of protein-protein interactions. Um, I actually, I'm very excited. I recently uh, got involved with a lab at Stanford, uh, the Colsta lab, I believe it's pronounced. And they're studying this thing called polyketide synthases, PKSs. And so what these things are, they're essentially these, so all these are proteins. So it's a massive, massive, over 2 million Daltons, right? I think it's two, two mega Daltons, over two mega Daltons in size, these, these protein complexes. And notice these tabs, right? These black tabs. Those tabs are domains in the protein that interact with the next domain, right? Why can't this protein interact with this protein? Because those protein protein interactions aren't favorable, right? They have different tabs, whereas these two tabs match, right? these two tabs match. And so it's the idea of, well, you can start making these things sequentially. You can have an assembly line, a molecular assembly line to make molecules based on these protein-protein interactions, based on these sequential interactions. And so it's honestly really beautiful. You can feed into really, you can feed these really simple molecules. You're like, hey, eat this, right? Eat this propanyl-CoA molecule, eat this NADPH, eat this methylmalonyl-CoA. And then what this protein complex will do is it'll take those molecules and it will sequentially add on more and more and more pieces until it reaches the end. And at the very end, it spits out this molecule here. And this molecule is actually um, a precursor to erythromycin. It's a really important antibiotic. So it's very useful in terms of you know, biomedical research and these kind of pharmaceutical interest, industries to understand the protein-protein interactions between these different uh, polypeptides. So this is honestly a really exciting field of research. And I guess we can now talk about the idea of yeast 2 hybrid. I know I've gone on, on a lot of tangents, okay? But let's, let's focus now. Let's focus on, let's start thinking about this idea of protein-protein interactions from the lens of how do we study it? How do we know if two proteins are indeed interacting, right? Because they're, they're tiny, you can't see them. Even with a microscope, you can't see them, right? How do we know if two proteins are interacting in a cell? Okay, before I address that question, let's have a look at transcription factors. So here we have the, some, some of you might call it the transcription initiation complex. You have RNA polymerase two, you have all these other proteins binding to it. We also have this thing here. So this is also a transcription factor, but it's special. People have studied this transcription factor for a while, and it turns out that sort of like the PKS, it has certain modules, right? You have module one, module two. This transcription factor, it also has modules. It's got two modules. I think, yeah, at least two modules. It's got a DNA binding domain module, DBD, DBD. And it also has a TAD module. This is the activating domain. So the DBD module, the DNA binding domain, it does what it sounds like it does. It binds the DNA. As you can see, this part of the protein, it, that's the part that interacts with the DNA. This part of the protein, it's an activation domain. It tells the other transcription factors and it tells the RNA polymerase 2 to start transcribing. 
So we have this idea of a modular transcription factor. And you guys told me that transcription factors can tell the RNA polymerase to, it'll, it'll control it, right? It'll tell it when to transcribe. I have a question for you guys. How do we use this system to study protein-protein interactions, right? I want you guys to start thinking like a synthetic biologist, right? How might you use a naturally occurring system like this system right here? How would you use it to study PPIs? Maybe text it in the chat. What are your thoughts? This is a hard problem. This is a hard problem. I'll give it maybe like half a minute or a minute. How might we use this modular TF transcription factor to study PPI? Okay, so Samantha says, take note of trends and patterns and their consequences. Very good, exactly. We can study how transcription factors interact with each other because they are proteins. Okay, that's a good idea. We can maybe study how these guys interact, right? Manipulate which protein domains are used in transcription and observe the interactions. Oh, now we're getting hot, we're getting spicy now, juicy. So, <laughs> sorry guys. So I think that that probably hits closest to home. We can manipulate which protein domains are used. Now there's one thing that we can probably think about. I'll, I'll be pretty impressed if you guys can guess how we can actually manipulate this. I'll give it maybe a few more seconds. Because I, for sure, I definitely could not have come up with, with this myself. But if any of you guys could. It's the idea of this module. Okay, so Andrew says, manipulate RNA initiation module. Okay, yes. Using different organisms, maybe, yeah, different organisms. That's part of it. Close, okay. You say manipulate, right? How do you manipulate? Let's be a little bit more specific about manipulation. I, I know I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of pushy here. I'm kind of, I'm kind of picky, but how do we manipulate? Right? I feel like manipulation is a really broad term. How do we manipulate? Let's try to think collectively, right? How might we manipulate these things? Extract DNA and create an artificial environment where transcription can take place. I think that's that's pretty close. <laughs> I'll give it to you, I'll give it to you. We wanna create something artificial, right? Synthetic biology, guys, symbio, synthetic biology. We wanna take something that's natural and we wanna design it, we wanna engineer it, right? Bioengineering, we wanna engineer it so that the final product is something that we can actually use. So I think artificial environment gets to the crux of the idea. We wanna create something artificial. Now, here is the key step, okay? The question is, how do we use this to study PPI? Here's what we do. Let's re-engineer this transcription factor, right? Let's create, like Gianni said, I'm sorry if I pronounced that name wrong, Gianni. Um, but as Gianni said, we wanna create something artificial, an artificial environment, right? Let's slit this thing in half, right? Let's use our you know, molecular biology things. Genie, thank you. <laughs> So Jeannie said, we want to create an artificial environment, right? Let's do that. Let's, let's split this thing in half. It's modular, right? By modular, it means that these different modules can work separately, right? It's kind of like in Canvas. Have you guys, I'm not sure if, if everyone uses Canvas or not, but in Canvas, you have these different modules in a class, right? You have module one, then module two, or different modules in a the course, right? Each module is kind of like its own separate thing, its own separate theme, right? It's kind of similar here. The DBD domain, the DBD module, its theme is to bind to DNA. So even if you cut this in half, it's still going to bind to the DNA. That's what it does, right? This TAD domain, this transactivation domain, its module, its theme is to activate this transcription, but only after it associates with the, D, the, the DBD, right? So given this hint, now, how might you re-engineer this thing to study PPI? Let's try to make it as generalized as possible, right? We want to take any protein in the world, or universe even, who knows, astrobiologists out there, in the universe. And then we want to know if 
this protein interacts with this protein. How do we use this system to do that? Any protein we want, right? How do we use this system? By splitting it in half, how do we use that to study PPIs? Go crazy in the chat, guys. And for everyone who, who proposed an answer, thank you for participating. Um, yes, thank you very much. Right, I want to be able to take any protein and I want to see if it interacts. Sorry, any two proteins and see if they interact. How do we use this to study that? Let's see. Andrew says, <laughs> Andrew, you got it spot on. Andrew says, attach one protein to DBD. If they interact, RNA polymerase will be affected. Exactly, right? So the idea is, well, if we split this in half, right, and we can somehow attach one protein to DBD. Exactly, right? Now, now we have a system where this DBD and this fused protein the DBD is going to bring that protein to the DNA because the DBD domain, its, its theme is to bind to DNA. Samantha says we can insert it. Yes, exactly. We can insert certain sort of protein uh, domains um, on top of the DNA binding domain, on top of this DBD. You have half the answer, Andrew. Attach one protein to DBD, where does the other protein go? Or anyone can answer, not just Andrew. Right? Attach one of the two proteins to DBD. Where does the second protein go? Andrew says the other goes to the TAD. Exactly. Exactly, right? That is the the crux of this technique of yeast two hybrid. So let's take a look at what exactly I'm talking about, right? Now, I'm going to walk you guys through the process. So the idea is if we have this DBD and we have this TAD and we can manipulate, we can split it in half and we can attach one protein to DBD and our second protein to TAD. If there is PPI between the protein one and protein two, they're going to interact, right? So protein one is attached to DBD. Protein two is attached to TAD. Right? DBD is binding to DNA. TAD is kind of floating around. If our protein of interest interacts, then it brings that TAD to the DBD, and then that TAD can start transcription. Right? The DBD and TAD together can start transcription. And so now you have a system. Right? Now you have a system where, OK, we have an if-then statement. Right? If the proteins interact, then TAD is brought to DVD, and then transcription will start. And so we then have some reporter gene, for example. That can then tell us if those two proteins interact, right? Beautiful, beautiful system. Whoever thought of this was mighty big brain. OK. Now let's take you through the process. OK, we have these proteins. Now, the transcription factor, the name isn't important, but it's called GAL4. So GAL4 is that TF. GAL4 is the transcription factor. Oh, so Jeannie says, wouldn't TAD already attach to DBD without the additional proteins? That's a very good point. That's a very good point. So let me go back to this slide here. So the idea is that there's only a certain surface, right? So TAD and DBD, they have um, these surfaces that are attached to it. And so typically, this is one polypeptide. So typically, these two, um, they don't really have a PPI per se, because it's just one protein. Right, so one protein doesn't really um, have PPI, we wouldn't say. It is one protein. If you were to split it down the middle, there's no guarantee that they will interact. Because typically, they're covalently attached. Right? But if you split it down the middle, then um, if they're not covalently attached, there's no guarantee that they will associate. They might to a certain extent. I'm not entirely sure about that. I would probably Google it up. But is that a phrase? Google it up? I don't know. But um, Yes, I, I don't think TAD will attach to DBD because if it does, then that'll ruin the whole purpose of yeast 2 hybrid and it seems to work. So does that answer your question, Jeannie? Or any follow-up questions? Or 
All right, anyways, moving on. So the TAD and the DPD, I feel like a premise of this is, yeah. Oh, I thought it was two different proteins, but that clears it up. Yes, exactly. So this is one protein and they're covalently linked. We want to split that covalent bond and we want to basically chop it up in pieces. Um, this transcription factor, we, we can call it GAL4. Let's just give it a name. This whole protein is GAL4, okay? Now, GAL4, we said we had a DBD and an activation domain. This is the TAD, this is the DBD. Let's design some DNA, right? Guys, DNA synthesis now is so powerful because we can literally, you know, type in the letters of the sequence and send it to a company and the company will synthesize that DNA piece and send it to us back. So we can design this to our advantage. Let's design it so that the GAL4 DBD domain is fused to the protein X, some random protein that we want to study, protein X. And let's also put protein Y next to the GAL4 TAD domain. So activation domain, TAD domain, same thing, right? Let's also study protein Z. Let's also attach protein Z in the same way as protein Y. So here's our question, right? Our question is, does protein X interact with protein Y, right? Do they kiss? I mean, the dog in the beginning, that's the goal. Do they kiss? All right, now kiss. Do protein X and protein Y interact? Yes or no? Do protein X and protein Z interact? Yes or no? Now, in this example here, we can't tell if Y and Z interact, right? Because Y and Z are both attached to TADs. This only works if you design it so that you attach one protein to GBD and the other to TAD. So here we're asking, does X interact with Y? Does X interact with Z, right? Let's, let's, let's see, let's figure it out. So <laughs> I include these images of dogs because it's kind of following the theme of the, the dog in the beginning, now kiss, right? These are sad dogs, maybe. Why are these sad dogs? Oh, Yushan asks, would we split the TAD and DVD proteins by using CRISPR-Cas9 to edit these proteins, DNA sequence, or would we use another protein to cleave them? Oh, good question. Um, I don't think you need either because initially these are DNA sequences, right? And we can design these DNA sequences as, as much as we want, right? We can insert an A here or a T there, or we can literally just take the entire domain of th that sequence, that DNA sequence, and then we put it next to the protein sequence of X. And then the, the cell will trans transcribe and translate that entire thing. So this right here is showing DNA not a uh, protein, if that clarifies things. Um, Ishan, any follow-up questions or does that answer it? Okay, thanks, awesome, okay, sweet. Um, please ask any, any questions, very, very much appreciated. Thank you guys for asking questions, by the way. These are great questions. Um, and for those of you who might not know, CRISPR-Cas9 is a gene editing system. Um, it's, it's very good for sort of precision editing, right? Single base pair substitutions, so, Andrew asks, is GAL4 a protein or DNA? GAL4 is a protein. So GAL4 is a transcription factor protein, and the protein has two domains, at least two domains. Um, in this scheme here, we're showing the DNA version of GAL4, because remember the central dogma, it goes from DNA to RNA to protein. So you can think of the thing as having different forms, right? GAL4 has a DNA form, form right? and it also has a protein form. So when we're talking about the transcription factor itself, we typically talk about the protein form. When we're talking about designing this DNA uh, sequence, that bit, we're talking about DNA. Does that make sense? Right, so through, through the central dogma, right, DNA to RNA to protein, this DNA sequence is going to be transcribed to mRNA and then finally protein. So at the very end of the day, this entire thing, this DNA sequence is going to be transcribed and translated into a, a fusion protein, a chimeric protein, right? An artificial protein, like Jeannie said, an artificial environment. So the final protein is going to have a DBD gal domain and also the protein X. It's kind of like a, a hybrid, right? If this is DBD and this is protein X and we synthesize it like this, the final product is going to be like that, right? They're, they're fused together. Same thing with Y and the TAD, right? Y and TAD, they're fused together now. And they travel together. Same with Z and uh, GAL, TAD. They fuse together and they travel together. So now let's think about 
so here we have x and y. So let's let's skip all the transcription translation. Assume that we are able to get that plasmid, that DNA, inside the cell. And the cell is happily turning away. It's making this GAL4 DBD binding domain. It's making this GAL4 AD binding domain, uh, not uh, binding domain, activation domain. But notice how we also have these fused proteins, right? Protein X, protein Y. Now, that right there is like trying to drive a screw down a nail hole, right? It's kind of like you're trying to, to put something where it doesn't belong, right? It doesn't really fit. Remember those tabs in the in the PKS example I told you? The tabs, they, they fit together, right? Of course, these are diagrams. It's not actually, you know, it's not actually how they look, but it's a diagram to, to show an idea of it. These don't interact well. They don't fit, right? No, no. So that's why these dogs are sad, right? The dog in the beginning was like, now kiss. And the dogs are like, no, but we can't. Our structures don't match. We don't have the favorable PPI. No favorable protein-protein interactions. So these dogs are sad, right? Sad puppy face because these don't interact. What does that mean in terms of transcription? These don't interact. No interaction, right? That means that the TAD and the DVD can't get close together, which means that transcription can't happen, which means that this reporter gene is not going to be expressed. So therefore, we don't get a signal, right? No reporter gene, no signal. That means there's no protein-protein interaction. That's the key idea, right? Now on, to, <laughs> now on to the positive interaction. Now there is interaction, right? Check this out. Protein X and protein Z, they fit like a lock in a key, uh, not lock in a key, key in a lock, <laughs> right? They fit like a key in a lock. So X and Z, they fit together. Oh, sweet. Now there's this favorable PPI, right? Now the DBD and the TAD can come together and they're interacting well. It's favorable. And now because they're interacting, now we have a fully functional transcription factor, right? And now this can start facilitating the transcription of this reporter gene. And so now we get a report. And so because the dogs kissed, because the proteins kissed, right? Now we have transcription. Now we have expression of this gene, of this reporter gene right here. All right, and that is the idea of yeast two hybrid. Turned out that GAL4 was found in yeast. That's why it's called yeast two hybrid. What's an example of a reporter gene? Could it be green fluorescent protein? Jeannie, you are stealing words out of my mouth. <laughs> because my next slide, oh, actually, never mind, not my next slide, but this slide here is what is a reporter gene. So we will, we will get to that. What is an unfavorable PPI? What would it look like? Um, of course, it's not always uh, black and white. So Samantha, you're exactly right. Like, what, what would an unfavorable one look like? This is typically unfavorable. I, I would call this unfavorable. So the, so the idea is that unfavorable PPIs, you know, that, oh, I shouldn't say unfavorable PPIs. I should say no PPIs, right? So every time I said unfavorable, erase that, just say no PPIs. So of course it's a gradient, but this is, this is hinging on the fact that if there is no PPI, there's going to be no transcription. If there is PPI, there's going to be a transcription. Does that clarify things, um, Samantha? Okay, awesome. Now, this is just a different sort of example showing the same exact thing. Now, I find it kind of funny <laughs> because they call the things bait and prey, right? So this is why it's called that. You, you design your plasmids, you know, you design your DVD. This is showing the same thing, right? The protein that you attach to the DVD, we call it the bait. And the protein you attach to the TAD domain, we call it the prey, right? So here's the idea. Your DVD is expressed and it's bound to the bait. And that DBD is going to sit on that DNA, right? This is sitting on the DNA. And it's kind of waiting, right? It's kind of like a trap. It's a bait, right? If any of you guys have gone fishing before, you use a bait to catch fish. It's kind of like a bait that's sitting there. And if there is a fish nearby, if there's a prey nearby, the bait's going to be like, ah, I got you, right? Now there's an interaction. There's PPI. And so this, this TAD domain, this GAL4 AD domain, can then be recruited. And then transcription can now happen, right? However, if the prey doesn't like the food, the bait's like, I mean, the, the prey's like, nah, that, that's not my fish food. There, there, there's gonna be no PPI and there's gonna be no transcription. So the gene won't be transcribed. So I've also seen the prey be uh, fish. So in some literature, you might see like bait and fish, <laughs> uh, bait and prey, I mean, same idea. The, the key concept is that the bait interacts with the prey or the protein X interacts with protein Z, for example. 
So you might call them different names. So Jeannie, you brought up a really good point, right? What is our, oh shoot, what time is it? <laughs> okay, 46, got 15 minutes. All right. What is the reporter gene? So you said GFP, good idea, right? Why not? <laughs> Let's put it next to a, a GFP protein, for example, right? Um, I'm not, actually, I'm not quite sure about that because GFP isn't expressed naturally in these yeast. So the GAL4 system is in yeast. That's why it's called yeast 2 hybrid. You're making a hybrid system in yeast, yeast 2 hybrid. GFP isn't expressed naturally in yeast. So I don't think GFP will be a good idea. You might be able to find a way to engineer it. And I wouldn't be surprised if there, if there are people out there who could be able to do this. But the examples that I'm going to give are beta galactosidase. Some people call it beta gal. Right? If you were in my lecture uh, for IPTG, I think it was like the first seminar, or the, the first webinar or something, we talked about IPTG inju induction. And then one of the genes that was involved with this thing was this thing called beta galactosidase. And for those of you who were there, you know that beta galactosidase, it cleaves apart this thing, uh, this sugar. It turns out that you can modify the, the yeast such that you can have the DVD domain bind to the promoter region of this LAC-Z gene expressing beta-gal. And then, for example, let's say your protein interacts. Your TAD domain gets recruited, you start transcription, you express this gene, you express this beta-galactosidase. Now, what does this gene do? What does this protein do, more specifically? beta galactosidase it cleaves things. It's an enzyme, right? That ACE there, right there, it means enzyme. It turns out that typically it's used for breaking down, for example, um, lactose, I think lactose as well. But there is this molecule called X-gal, and it's, common, it's commonly used in, you know, molecular, molecular biology or synthetic biology. It turns out that if you feed in this X-gal molecule, and then beta galactosidase is also there. Beta galactosidase will cleave X gal. It'll spit off this sugar molecule here. And you're going to be left with this molecule here. We'll call it molecule one, right? And it turns out that molecule one can dimerize. If any of you, if, if any of you are interested in the organic chemistry of it, it's also very fascinating. But these molecules can dimerize. And it forms this molecule two right here. You can see it's kind of similar, right? It's just two of this, basically connected with this uh, double bond. So does any of, do any of you guys recognize this molecule? Any of you, any of you who might have taken an orgo course before or have you know, studied, for example, some, some I don't want to give it away. Well, I guess this, this is giving it away. But something about blue, maybe, maybe text it in the chat. That's okay, this is pretty hard. <laughs> it turns out that this is actually an indigo derivative. Indigo, guys, are any of you guys wearing jeans right now? <laughs> if you're wearing jeans, you've got indigo on you, right? Those denim jackets people wear for fashion, right? Indigo, this is a derivative of indigo. It's not exactly indigo. It's got these halogens popping off of it, but it's an indigo derivative and it's also blue. So if your proteins interact and it makes this beta gal, then you start uh, adding this X-gal molecule. You're going to start making this indigo derivative. And then your, your culture will literally turn blue. If it's blue, you'll be like, oh, that means that those two proteins interact. So good question, Jeannie. This is what the reporter gene might look like. Any questions about this system here? OK, awesome. Let me check the time, actually. It's OK, 7.50. Got 10 more minutes. I'll try to save a few minutes um, at the end for questions or more elaboration. OK, another reporter gene. There are multiple options, guys. The beauty of this is that you can, it's adaptable, right? You can use any protein. It's very generalizable. You can also use almost, you know, not any reporter gene, but there are a few reporter genes you can choose from. For example, LAC-Z or HIS3. So HIS3 is another option that you can use for, uh, your assay, your yeast, your yeast 2 hybrid assay. Now, if your two proteins interact and it transcribes this HIS3 gene and it makes this HIS3 protein, it turns out that HIS3 protein is an enzyme that helps catalyze a step to make histidine. Cells need histidine, okay? 
this is histidine, it's an amino acid, right? And cells need, need proteins, right? It's kind of like cells need their, their proteins as well, just as much as we do. Yeast as well. Yeast need these amino acids. If your, if your uh, proteins interacted, which one would it look like? Would it look like the top one or the bottom one? Top or bottom? So this is a, a plate that doesn't have histidine. Andrew says top. Yeah, Arthur says top. Yep, exactly. Top is correct. If, you're, if your two proteins interact, you'll transcribe HIST3. HIST3 will help make this histidine. And then only those cells that can make histidine will survive. So only in those cells where, the, where those PPIs are present will they survive. So if you see cell colonies, that means that those proteins have interacted, right? If you don't see them, that means that they probably did not interact and your cells are all dead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so good job, guys. Uh, I'm, that's, that's pretty good. So hopefully that, that makes sense, this system. Now, are there any questions regarding the, the yeast to hybrid system that we talked about? Why is this only done in yeast and not bacteria in a process like bacterial transformation? Good question. So it turns out that um, GAL4 is present in yeast. That's one system. That's one type of system. It turns out that, you know, biologists have gone and done a whole lot of other studies and they have engineered certain bacteria to do this as well. So it's called yeast to hybrid because it started off in yeast, but it, it can be used in bacteria. It can even be done in like, uh, I think certain types of algae and also in things like um, plants as well. If you guys have heard of um, Arabidopsis thaliana, this, this system can also be used in Arabidopsis as well. So it's not just yeast, it's very generalizable. So good question though, good question. It's good to think generalized, right? It's good to think generalized. So let's end off by talking about some limitations because it turns out that yeast to hybrid, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty picky experiment, right? There are high rates of false positives and false negatives because even if you get you know, some partial PPI, it might still transcribe and your cell colony is still micro or it might turn a little bit blue, right? Um, so there are high rates of false positives and false negatives. So we also have to think about these kinds of errors, right? How do we, how do we make the experiment better or, or what kind of other results would help us verify these things? So it turns out that if you only use a yeast to hybrid assay, you probably won't have much support because a yeast to hybrid assay is actually really easy to do. You're going to want to accumulate more data. There's more ways to study PPI. This is one of them, right? This is only the tip of the iceberg. Furthermore, these PPIs must also take place in the nucleus, right? If, for example, your proteins don't interact in the nucleus, but they do interact in the cytosol, for example, you still will get no expression, right? So that's the limitation here. It has to be um, in the nucleus. And that, that might be bad for certain cases and certain situations. Um, you know, in yeast, we want to study any protein we want. We might want to study plant cells or animal cells, animal proteins. We want to see how they interact. It might be different in yeast, right? Yeast is a fungus. In yeast, uh, it, might, it might modify the protein in certain ways. It might fold in, in different ways, different conformations in yeast. So that's why that's also a limitation. You know, these engineered proteins, you're, you're combining, you're fusing them, right? the total might be different from its parts. So maybe the total protein, maybe that fused chimeric protein might fold differently and that'll have consequences in terms of your PPI. So there's all these different, you know, there's all these different types of things you can get into. Well, there's all these error rates. So you need more experiments, right? More fun <laughs> or more work. You can, you can call it that too, more work as well. So there are other ways to study PPI. So for example, there's this thing called, uh, I think it was like BLI. If you guys are interested, search up biolayer interferometry. Um, it's another way that you can study PPI with optic fiber cables. Um, so oftentimes you're going to want to accumulate different pieces of evidence to determine do these proteins interact. Now, yeast to hybrid is not the end of the story. Oh, what time is it? I need to keep checking. Okay, four minutes. Perfect. Yeast to hybrid is not the only thing that's available, right? There's also things like yeast to one hybrid <laughs> or yeast three hybrid or split ubiquitin yeast to hybrid. There's all these different sort of, you know, modifications. There's these different sort of variants of the yeast to hybrid. And you can see how powerful this idea is, right? You take this idea of yeast to hybrid and you can apply it to, for example, protein DNA interactions 
or protein RNA interaction, or you know, protein protein interactions between membrane proteins that aren't in the nucleus, or you know, simultaneous protein DNA or protein protein. So there's all these different you know ways you can combine these things together. But guys, the premise is still the same. You're still fusing together these different types of proteins, and you're still seeing not proteins, proteins or DNA, and you're seeing if they interact. So the concept is the same. But you can see how it can be applied to so many different examples. So it's pretty cool how you know the system can be you know very very far fetched and very powerful. All right, that is the end of my talk, and I left I think just enough time for a few questions. So if you have any questions, fire away in the chat. Go ahead. I'll give it maybe a few seconds because typing a question might take some time. <laughs> Thank you all for coming though. Um, it's, it's great to see so many people who are interested in bio and learning over the summer, you know. Bye-bye. Oh, bye-bye. <laughs> okay, so Junior said, sorry if I missed it, but can you explain why detecting PPI is useful? Okay, one example. Um, let me go back to um, this thing right here. So I talked about it before. Um, it's okay if you missed it. So I'll talk about it briefly for now. Um, PPI is useful for pretty much every protein interaction in the cell, right? You think about enzymes, right? Enzymes, they might have to be activated by certain things, by certain phosphorylases, for example, right? Signal transduction pathways might have to have protein-protein interactions. Antibody-antigen interactions, that's PPI, right? Um, you can also have things like uh, this, this mega complex, right? If you think about transcription itself, the transcription initiation complex, all of that is also PPI, right? The different TFs have to interact in certain ways to transcribe the gene in a certain way. Um, this example comes from a lab that I recently joined, um, polyketide synthases. And what they do is they're looking at these different proteins. So DEBS1 is a protein, DEBS2 is a protein, DEBS3 is a protein. And these tabs right there, those are domains in the protein that can interact with the next protein. So for example, DEBS1 interacts with DEBS2. DEBS3 inter uh, DEBS2 interacts with DEBS3. So you have almost like an assembly line, right? Think about Ford, right? You want to make a car. How are cars made? Well, back then they were made using assembly lines. I'm not sure if they're still made like that today. Probably. Something like that, right? The idea of an assembly line is you do one thing specifically. Right? Each step does one thing specifically. I want to put a nail here, or I want to put this piece of the car here, right? And you go step by step until eventually you get a car. Same idea here, right? You have an assembly line of proteins, and this assembly line is going to pass on each molecular product, each chemical, to the next module. Module 1 goes to module 2, module 2 goes to module 3, but it can't do that unless there's that PPI, right? And it turns out that this this mega protein complex can make really important natural products for things like antibiotics. So this thing right here, whoops, this thing right here to the right, uh, 6-DEB is 6-deoxyerythronolide B. Um, that's a precursor to erythromycin, which is an antibiotic. So there's all these different applications for PPI. And it turns out that yeast 2 hybrid is one of the many, many different ways you can use to detect that. All right, good question though. It's always good to think about application. Any other questions? Can we use yeast 2 hybrid to study interactions between antibodies and coronavirus? Uh, yes, I don't see why not. <laughs> oh, and I'll stop recording too. Uh, stop recording, sweet.